no today. You all look great. Happy St. Patrick's Day. So, uh, our panel today is going to be very exciting. It's um, abstract stories. So we're going to learn a little bit about, you know, the, the composition and the why and the inspiration for abstract art. And uh, we got a rowdy crowd today. So, and welcome to anyone watching online. We are enjoying a beautiful sunny day here in Scottsdale today. And some special guests have flown in and yay, we're happy to have you. So uh, today I, I will be happy to introduce our panel starting with my friend Adolfo Garala. Adolfo is from California. We're going to have to tell us a little bit about themselves in a minute. And then Kathleen Hope, who lives right here in Fountain Hill. And then uh, formerly from Minnesota. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got wise and moved to the sun. And then we have Stuart Yankel, who splits his time between Connecticut and Arizona. So welcome. So the abstract stories, we really just kind of wanted to delve into um, trying to explain a little bit maybe about why artists choose abstract over uh, representational and what inspires them. And uh, I think we'll have a good discussion. We talked a little bit this morning at our artist meeting in the morning, and maybe Stuart might share some of that because he posed a question there. But um, I'd like to start by starting with Stuart. Have you tell us a little bit about um, your background as a painter and how this came to be. Yes, and hold the microphones close. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Testing one, two. So I come uh, into abstract painting maybe from uh, a little bit different direction than uh, some of the other abstract painters. I've been known much more as a figurative painter uh, in my career. Today I have one abstract piece and one of the figurative paintings here. And uh, I was pretty fortunate to have uh, a, pre uh, a classical training uh, back in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and studied in Italy and did uh, some other training. And initially I was a very uh, representational formal portrait painter. And to this day I continue to do a fair amount of retirement portraits for universities and uh, that type of thing. But I've always been a, a believer in the uh, strength from diversity, and I most of the artists that I always loved had been all over the map, so I have, have made it my endeavor to uh, work uh, very broadly from uh, classical realism up to the pure abstract painting, and they kind of brought me in uh, through left field today because Susan, Susan said she likes the composition in my rep representational paintings enough to grant me a seat on the board today. <laughs> well, I, yes, of course. And partly I think all of your representational starts with abstraction. So you can talk about that a little bit later. Or maybe that's just my eyes. No, for sure. I mean, it's... I might... I think as a, as a painter, we're... So much of it is, is the work of the language. That we're wrestling with all these principles that we know, and certainly the whole idea of the abstraction is, is one thing that we're always reaching for, whether it be uh, designing a building or a sculpture or a painting or, or you know, a representation or an abstract painting. Those same ideas that we're going to delve into today you'll see as an integral part of, of our daily life. So. Well said, well said. Thank you. All right, Kathleen, tell us a little bit about how you got here. So I, um, my background, I didn't go to formal um, art school, but I come from a background of interior design, and also my specialty is color. So I actually um, studied color for two years. Yes, you did? Okay. Yeah, ice cream cone. Yes. Um, so my background is very, very heavy with color. I studied um, color psychology, and but it was basically geared towards the architectural field. So I used to be a color consultant for architects, builders. Um, I did interior, exterior design, um, but 
yeah, I also dove into the psychology of it, which has to do with like what colors you would choose for like um, medical facilities. Um, there are certain colors you don't want to use based on psychology. Uh, so that's my background, but uh, you had mentioned something about uh, why do you why why do you choose abstract? I think it chooses you. Um, I remember when I first had an interest in painting, I was learning more landscape, more representational work, and I I kept going in class and. I could do it, but then every time I get something done, I'd like mess it up, and, I'd, <laughs> and it just wasn't me. I I don't see art abstraction or painting that way. I see it more as shapes, lines, and the even trying to paint. I can paint um, representational, but it just is not the way I like to paint. It chooses you. It does choose you, and then we choose you. <laughs> yes, and I will be, we'll dive into some of the composition and geometry or figurative, or what's the word I'm trying to Anyway, geometry of your paintings a little bit more. And then my dear friend Adolfo, um, you, you've been an artist since the beginning of time. No, no. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe you can say that, but... Uh, I just didn't know it. No, I really don't know why I'm even sitting here, really. <laughs> uh, for me, this old, this old art thing just came to me. I was born in Cuba, and there I didn't really uh, have any opportunity to do any art. Or wasn't, I was not even inclined to do any art. I was just playing on the beach, blah, blah, blah. And then I came to this country in 1980, and I became a technician in electronics. And I worked for that industry for 17 years, repairing, repairing flight control computers for the airport. And halfway down the line, I got bored with what I was doing, and I started then, you know, in my spare time, doing little paintings. Little painting, actually, little incense holders, hats, you know. I had no idea what a canvas was, what the acrylics were. <laughs> And uh, in, so this happened to me in 1994. And when I discovered this beautiful thing that came to me, this you know, painting, I just couldn't stop painting. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, for me, art is very emotional. It's, it's about feeling, it's about Whatever comes to my mind, whatever colors come to my mind, I acknowledge it because why would it have come to my mind? So I'm very concerned about what kind of colors I'm using for this composition or that. I just go for it. You know, like the Nike commercial said, just do it. And so, and I trust the process, you know, I trust the process to guide me. And believe me, many times I feel very insecure. A lot of the times I feel very insecure. Uh, really not knowing what I'm doing, but you know, I have learned to trust the process, you know, and at the end it all comes out really nice. And I like what she said about you know, the abstract chooses you, it does. And when I do my abstract work, and I haven't for a while, you know, like I might just put a painting, an abstract painting, then that painting could also change into a I could put a sailboat, let's say, on that painting, and it becomes totally different. I totally different that kind of people are gravitated towards that painting when I sell it. So I just play with, you know, with whatever I'm in front of me, and I just, you know, I take it seriously, but also just, just do it, you know, just do it. So you're listening to your intuition. That's all. That's what it's all about for me. I'm very intuitive, but I really pay attention to. Not, you know, what, what, what that first thought comes, you know, like, for example, if I'm working on a piece and the color red comes to mind, I acknowledge that, I acknowledge that that came to me for a reason, and I use it, you know, and, you know, so, you do that, if you work organically, at the end, everything kind of comes out, you know, the way, well, um, I probably should have, Actually looked up the definition of abstract art, but in, I don't know. 
Okay, according to the encyclopedia, I like that you didn't say Google, so this is the encyclopedia. How many of you had a full edition? Okay, door to door salesman. The main purpose of abstraction in art is not to tell a story, but to encourage involvement and imagination. Main objective to provide viewers an intangible and emotional experience being completely different for each individual and mood. There it is. Fabulous. Yeah, that's it. And the, the rest of you guys, I will let you read. But, but um, a lot of people ask us what we collect. And if you were to walk in our house, we have a wide variety of styles and mediums. And, you know, we literally love every piece of art that we have because it does connect that emotion and that feeling and you know the literal joy of art and I like the abstract pieces because it does exactly what that definition is. It lets your mind interpret what, what it means to you and there is absolutely deep emotion um, just as much as if you looked at a portrait with, you know, a beautiful face with, filled with emotion. That, the, the way that these artists capture the the color and the composition and just the order in which you put it on your canvas. Um, so I hope you all feel the same way. Or, or if you don't, maybe after today you will. But um, it really does evoke that emotion. So tell us what it means to you. I know. Right in the way. Are we good? Okay, yes. Okay. So the reason, actually, I I wrote the definition down. Not for Susan, but I... <laughs> Thank you, I really know. Um, because in general, I agree with that. But one of the things that they said in the dictionary was that abstraction in art is not to tell a story. Um, I don't agree with that. Because I think that... Many, many times, um, if you're very in tune with color, line, um, your emotions, when you create an abstract piece of art, there are many times when people will kind of get your message. And I'm just going to give you an example of something that happened actually here. So I had been to Berlin and I had taken all these photos of graffiti. And when I came back home, I created this, uh, these totems of graffiti. And this woman comes right up to him and she says, oh my gosh, I just, I love these, I have to have these. And she said, and I didn't say anything about them at all, I just was listening to what she said. And she said, you know, I think my husband will really like these too. You know, he's from Berlin. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Wow. And um, I said, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I said, um, I was just in Berlin. And this is where these photos, I mean, the graffiti could have been anywhere, you know. And so... I showed her all the pictures of the graffiti in Berlin, and she she bought them. Right, she's like, I can't believe this, this. I remember that. Yeah, and then one other. There's been many many stories like that. There was one time I was in New York, and I had just gotten back from uh, Oslo, and I went to this fabulous museum. It was called the uh, uh, Viglin Museum, and the sculptures there were all nudes all figuratives, they were absolutely mind-blowing, stunningly beautiful. And I came back and I said, how am I going to abstract these figures into a painting? And so um, I just did this real white version of entangled kind of forms. And when I was in New York, this, this woman comes up to me and she said, um, well, I really, really love this painting. It has such a, a stark feeling to it, like, like Norway. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, um, this was an interpretation of 
of Augusta uh, Bigland, his entanglement of bodies statue. And she goes, that's my favorite music. <laughs> Yeah. And there's many other stories like that. So so I really do think in abstraction, if you're very in tune with line, your emotions, when you put that down, somebody's going to connect to it. They may not understand it and they may not voice it, but, but somebody will connect with it. And that stuff happens all the time here. I don't know if any of you know it, but Susan had a career as a magician in Vegas for 20 years. <laughs> There's a deep undercurrent that connects everything within this, uh, this tent here. Magic! <laughs> Alright, better carry on. Okay, so that, I love that. And I love, it's like geography comes into play. And um, people do have a sense, you know, that again, the intuition, the, the connection happens. We see it here happen immediately. When somebody walks up to a piece of art and they connect to it, it, it's you. You watch their face light up. They, they their posture changes, and I, I can always go, "Oh, that's going home," <laughs> because that's why they do what they do. Is every piece of art is created for the the one person or couple that's going to come in and say, "I have to have that," and it's almost instantaneous. And so, Stuart, back to um, when I came to ask Stuart, I really have always looked at his work is more abstract. Even though he's got figures and he's got like a, a scenery, I'm, I just love it because you've got, you've got the line, you've got the composition, and then you do also do the purely abstract. But tell us about the inspiration that brings you to do what you do. Well, I was going to uh, also talk about when I first began to delve into the pure abstract because coming out of a tradition as a realist painter, you know, there's a bit of snobbery on that side. It's like uh, motor boaters versus sailboaters. And when I first Which one of those is snobby? Both of them? I guess both of them. Yeah. Right. But when I first jumped into that sea of the abstract painting, I literally felt like I was riding a bull up in Cave Creek because as a realist painter, you sort of have something to hold on to. So if you're painting a person or a tree or uh, what have you, you know that, that that your mind can carry you in that direction, but as you're trying to complete a painting without any of those reference points, and essentially I think we're trying to, you know, pay some rich homage to what it means to being alive, so you're sort of trying to bring a painting to life somehow. And in doing that, you know, there's, like I say, you're not following any rational thinking. Like, like, Adolf, like we've been saying, it's more of this deep uh, instinctual uh, leap of faith that you have to follow in order to come to some conclusion. And uh, it, when you look at my two uh, different pieces here, you, you almost see a lot of the same threads that carry from one to the other. Like the most old painting is very much about the the in, the uh, use of broad uh, lighting. Like if you think of Rembrandt, it's all about the raking light across the scene. And you see that in this in this uh, dining theme, but even in the abstract painting here, it, it sort of carries a lot of those same elements of uh, you know the highlights from light to dark, and you know all of the same uh, principles carried through. Whether it's the balance of colors, the balance of light to dark, the balance of the rhythms, the balance of the simplicity versus the complexity, and uh, I do uh, want to share one other quick anecdote about uh, uh, Jackson Pollock. I remember going to one of his shows, and at the time I had never thought too much of Pollock, but upon entering this massive uh, exhibit of his work, I felt like it was like a, uh, uh, like a show of fireworks or a show of uh, particle accelerators. Like when you see them live, you just feel that you know, energy of the process being carried through the work, almost like a uh, like a, a cubicle of, of light or energy that that people you know want to live with, and and that you know is essentially our endeavor to uh, you know bring that 
bring that to life for people to, to experience and share. Yeah. Excellent. T talking about Jackson Polo, you know, this guy here. <laughs> it, you know, uh, and it's it's about you know you can anybody could do that obviously it's just you know but it's no, the idea. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> if you get somebody in the same colors, you know, everybody yeah, the colors on the same canvas, and you can just go ahead and do it. Everybody's going to do it differently. Next, they're going to be the same. But you know, uh, so. In here, it's basically more working, having fun with the colors and, and putting the music on, and, you know, and dancing around painting and throwing the painting, and, you know what I mean, and just living it, you know, just enjoying that process. Um, and then that's what happens, you know, particularly of colors, you know. And so I love Jackson Polo's work because, he, I mean, the guy is, was amazing. He's, you see his work in person, it's like so impressive. But I have gotten a little bit farther than Jackson Park because when I apply my colors, then I cover them all up with copper in this case, and then I start sanding it, and then the colors start coming right through. And then what happens is that as you walk around the painting, it kind of shift colors, and you can see different things. So it's more about you know how the light reflects the, the painting back at you, and this movement, and, you know, subtlety. Uh, and, and, you, and you love shape. We see a lot of them. Yeah, and for example, this painting in the back, I believe I started it back in um, 2016 to 2018. <laughs> and during that time, it was these three orbs that you see behind. I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting. You know, the, the three moons. You see it? Yeah. Yeah. So after many years of going from blue to red to black, to sanding it, blah, 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 This last year, I mean last year in December before I came to the show, and I had COVID, so I had to be in my studio for 10 days. I couldn't even get out. I started doing these little things, you know, that you see in front of it. And then I cover it with silver leaf, and then I glaze it with other colors. Anyway, so it's just going and going and going and going. So from 2016 to 2023, I think she needs a home. <laughs> <laughs> Let's find her a home. And I always love that people, frequently artists here will hear the question, how long did that take you to paint? <laughs> and that's a really challenging question because it might have, in some cases, taken an artist a few hours to yeah. lay the paint on there. But there was a lot of time before that, or it's like it stays around for years well, and reinvents itself. Yeah, I mean, seriously, I, I have had paintings where I have done it, you know, in a very short time, you know, like not even, let's say a week, okay? And I call those a gift because it happens only once in the blue moon. Most of the time, you really have to really, you know, polish these things and keep adding colors and taking colors off and adding color. Just endless process, but once in a while, yeah, you have these paintings that are that just one painting comes and it's like wow. And so that's a gift that you stop, you know. And then people ask me, when do you know when you know your painting is finished? Well, I know when it's finished when I have the painting on the wall a long time. And I'm walking around my life and it doesn't bother me. But one day, I might just walk into a room, into the room, and the same painting tells me I want a, like a red, a place of red. Say. For example, this one here. Today, I mean, this painting was showing here, and the background was completely black. And today, last night, I thought, you know, I should do this. I should just put this copper and then do the sanding. So it just happened today. You know? So, it, you know, God knows that tomorrow it will be red. <laughs> I like the copper. I'm just saying. Yeah. What do you think? Copper? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, nice. Very good. So, this morning's kind of our discussion was a little bit about, uh, well, I'll let, you, I'll let you talk about that in a minute, Stuart, but I'm going to go back to Kathleen because one of the great things, there's many great things about your work, is we see layers, we see color, we see texture, we see composition, and they each they each tell a story, even though sometimes the story can be up to us, but you have a story. Um, 
Okay, I was told to talk louder. I have a soft voice, so. Um, so there's a painting term uh, that abstract artists use, um, figurative artists use, basically it's called, sometimes when you look at a painting you say, oh, that's a little thin. Um, what that means is that a painting isn't developed. You feel no soul. And I think that when you look at Adolfo's work, you look at Stuart's, mine, most, I would say everybody in the tent, they're, these people, these artists have spent years and years developing their, their art. And you feel that soul. It's not thin. And I think that that's what every artist kind of strives to have in their art is just a soul. And that comes from not just putting your energy into it, but it's also, it's more about just mastering your, and being comfortable with your medium. And, and you, right away, you know, you start, you, when you first start a medium, you don't, it's kind of like, there's so many mediums to choose from. So when you first start in art, there's just so many choices that you don't even have time to really hone in and become a, a good artist because you're just experimenting. But once you find, find your medium, it's, it's like a, a good marriage. It's, it's like your voice can be expressed. And I feel like with my work, you know, for 15 years I just experimented with different products and nothing really, every, everything I tried was just not right. And I knew it, but that my voice wasn't being heard until I found cement. Yet you were so. still successful with those other mediums, but this, yes. like I love your card say, fluent in cement. Yes. <laughs> That's because I wish I could speak some languages, but I don't. I could just do cement. <laughs> So, but that's my tagline, fluent in cement, because it took me a really long journey to find my medium, but once I found it, it, it just, I knew it was the right fit. And, and, but it just, again, it took me a long time to be able to express myself with the medium because you first technically had to learn how to use it. Do you think part of the reason you've connected with that is because it is fluid as you're working with it? I mean, maybe talk a little bit about your technique. Um, so when I first started um, kind of diving into art, there was only two things I said that I wanted my art. I wanted to be in contemporary modern homes, and I wanted texture and I wanted it to be organic and contemporary at the same time. But to try to find that, it, that, that was always in my mind, but I never, I never found it until, um, let's see, I think I've been working in cement for about 12 years now. So, and, and that's come true. I mean, my, my art's in very contemporary homes, but it, it also works in a variety of homes because it's organic contemporary, it's got texture, um, cement's very difficult to work with, uh, I will never master it, but I feel like I, I've gotten a pretty good handle on it, and I love working with it because of the way that it accepts color, but um, it's very messy, so that's why I don't work here. Susan wouldn't let me. <laughs> so. do, do you do a sanding in your work? Do you sand? Yeah, I sand. I sand it sometimes. Yeah. Mostly it's pouring. Yeah. Do jackhammer too? Oh, yeah. And do you do you do you mix the pigment into the cement or do you apply the cement and then paint on it? It's a combination of both. So I mi I mix like liquid tint into the wet cement. Um, and then I also paint over it with like inks, stains, acrylics. Um, it doesn't work with oil. I'm allergic to it anyway. Um, so, but yeah, that's basically my, my pigments. Uh, and is this a regular cement? Um. Um, it's a really fine grit cement. 
and it's it's I it's make important. my own mixes. Yeah. So I always have to work in my studio because it's very controlled, and 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 I have some somewhat control over the patinas that I do on on the cement. And your work can be um, enjoyed indoors or outdoors. Yes, I. I do do outdoor work. Um, basically, I have a few pieces in the front that are for outdoors, and that's a little different process because it's on a um, cement board and it's framed in a steel frame. And I use concrete stains and concrete sealers meant for driveways. So, <laughs> so actually, it really does hold up um, in our weather. But I usually take commissions for my outdoor work because I um, it's too. Most of my work that I do in my gallery is all on wood panel, and I have 10 galleries I show in as well, and I just don't have the time to create the outdoor inventory. So most my work that I do for indoor can be done outdoor. So I, that's why I take commissions. Very good. All right, um, so Stuart, can you kind of expound on what we talked about this morning about your question about the abstract versus uh, representational and how they, how they, what Susie talked about or Roxy. That was a long time ago. That was like hours ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think you know most most painters being steeped in this language for you know whatever decades are, are pretty well aware that these two languages are two sides of the same coin. That abstraction and realism are are, you know, they say the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, and anyone working in either of those directions is, is uh, uh, enlightened by, you know, what they have from the other side. But before we leave Pollock, um, one, he probably had one of the greatest lines in the history of art when they said, uh, because we have to understand what a magnanimous change it was in the 20th century when abstract art, uh, you know, was born, um, that they said, Jackson, why don't you paint from nature? Because before that, every, everyone was essentially painting nature. And he said, I am nature. And, uh, Good answer. yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of the idea is that, that, uh, you know, we are in fact part of nature. And so, so much of, uh, uh, like I said, the 20th century sort of breaking open the language of art and allowing artists to just set that set the uh, the representational aspect aside and just explore the freedom of how to you know complete an entire painting solely on the merits of its uh, abstract qualities on its colors principles and you know we do hear that question how do we know when a painting is done uh, like Adolfo said I, I often reference like Tolstoy with war and peace because until, until we come to peace with that painting it's just going to annoy the living hell out of us <laughs> everyone thinks that you know it's so pleasant to play with the pretty colors all day but when I'm in the studio I sound a little more like Nadal and uh, it uh, gets a little more verbal out there but uh, yeah that's very good no, it's true though. It take it, it does take time and a lot of people not so much here because we have a very well educated uh, group that comes here, but we've been in places where people think, Oh, anybody could paint that. Well, it's not true. We can't. Most of us can't and there is a lot of thought that goes into abstract art and I was talking to Robin Brandon who refuses to do a panel, even though she should, but um, she you know, she's second generation and now Collins third generation um, artist. Her father was an abstract painter as well. And there's so much thought that goes into it. It's not just throwing, even Pollock, who has been criticized by some, but he didn't just throw paint at a canvas. There was a, there was a thought out process and um, it really does have to work all together or you're just going to have a messy mud pie. So. They become gray. They they become gray and unattractive to and most no of soul, it. No soul. No no soul in that one. And, and, and sometimes it's it's simply the 
material or the technique, you know, with Pollock, you know, simply that act of throwing paint, you know, which seems so, you know, rudimentary or childlike, it just kind of opened a whole branch in the language. It's like Gerhard Richter, many of you may know that one of the top selling painters in the world is German abstract painter, who essentially uses these long flat spatulas to drag paint across the canvas. And again, it sounds, you know, almost uh, rudimentary, but he's created like a vast language of, you know, his own uh, effects and in fact hundreds of thousands of people that have kind of followed in his footsteps to, you know, uh, to build upon that simple idea, you know. And, uh, Is there any um, artist from history that has in inspired and in... in oh yeah, uh, what's his name? Uh, it's got, he, I forgot his name now, but he's got, he does a painting with the different colors, um, red. Rothko. Ras Rothko. 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 Yeah. Rothko. The guy that does paintings with different colors, that's Rothko. Oh. Rothko. Yeah. Rothko. <laughs> or Mondrian. Mondrian. Yeah, his, his work is just amazing. I, I, was, I had the opportunity to go and see his work in person. And, uh, it was incredible. Uh, but one thing about his work that I found out is that he didn't really care what materials he used in order to achieve the colors that he wanted, you know. So he would use can, you know, paint from his house, whatever. So because of that, uh, a lot of his work is actually now um, deteriorating and it's really hard to put it back together. And he had a really bad ending too, I don't even know about his life, but at the end, um, uh, he got it, he didn't want to give him back his 50 or 80 paintings and he actually got very depressed and killed himself. Which I would never do, because, you know, I mean, after all... Because see, we need you. Well, okay, well, let, let's, let's not talk about that. <laughs> but yeah, that, he, that, he was amazing. Amazing guy. Kathleen? I, I think there's a lot of artists that uh, I'm inspired by, but one of them isn't really well known. Um, he kind of hung around that whole New York group. Um, uh, uh, Conrad Marcarelli. And I remember, at the time I was living in Minneapolis, and I really didn't know much about art, but I remember going to the museum, and he had this one painting, it was just huge, it was called The Trial. And I must have sat in front of that painting and just, it was kind of like a light bulb moment for me. It's like, I want to do that. And his paintings are all about shapes. They're just shapes and minimal color. But the way he used his shapes, I'm surprised he wasn't... I mean, he's, he's well known, but he, he, he definitely was one of the better, better artists. With Like, he hung around uh, Dick Kooning and um, he was in New York that whole time. So I, I think... I, I just liked his movement and his shapes and lines and, and his art. And was, did he use a lot of color as well? Or was he it more the movement? Some, he used some color, um, but it was very, it was very minimal, very minimal color. I mean, I, I think that, you know, being a color, being a colorist, I'm very, very good with color, but Sometimes I really just like using minimal color, black and white. Um, and it's just the simplicity of it, you know, that um, I, I really gravitate towards um, just very, very simple shapes, line um, with minimal color because I think the less color that you use can sometimes have a very impactful um emotional response, like Rothko. He just uses like just a few colors. Because sometimes when you use too many colors at once, it's like too much information. It's, it doesn't give you that emotional response. Um, also, just one more note on color. Every one of us is a little bit like um, either more introvert or more extrovert, we all have both. And that also has a very uh, big 
impact on how you're going to choose your colors and your art. Because when you're a more introvert like me, I tend to not like too much loud, saturated colors. I like minimal, I don't like a lot of clutter in my house. And, and um, I just, I can't, like too much red or too much purple or certain colors is very, they're very assaulting to me. Isn't it you don't like pink because your mom used to make oh. color pink? <laughs> Actually, I embraced pink this year. Oh, good. Yes. Well, it, it took me 10 years. That magenta is the color. <laughs> yes. Viva, magenta is the color of the year. Um, there are certain colors based on our, like, cultural background, but also our personality. And there are many situations where sometimes growing up, you have a negative association with color that can affect you your whole life and you you might not even like consciously are aware of it but think about colors you don't like there might be some connection to a bad experience like my mother uh, <laughs> my mother used to decorate <laughs> in rows everything was rose in her house and to this day I cannot paint with rose because I had to live in that color that I hated. She had rose carpet, rose walls. <laughs> and so everybody has some sort of negative and positive association with color. Childhood and, trauma. Yeah, it's yeah. like trauma. <laughs> so um, I, I think that I always say uh, sometimes with art, like, some people are a little bit more Las Vegas, and some people are Sedona. And I'm definitely more Sedona. Yeah, so. Good, good, well said, yeah. And, and I think we can all relate to that. I mean, we, we use color to lift our mood or to calm us down. And, you know, at the color panel a couple weeks ago, we talked about the use of colors in hospitals, which you obviously know a lot about. But, um, and... Lauren, where'd she go? Lauren Yagoda was over there. She does beautiful, primarily black and white or, you know, black and white scale. Um, powerful, powerful paintings with just using that color palette. So, and, and even as we go through our homes, you know, we might transition from our front room, which might be more vibrant or lively, into a more soft palette. And, and even, again, the composition dictates how, how you feel. So there's a lot that... There's an awful lot that really goes into that we may not actually think about from day to day of how art makes us feel. And I also love how you started using a lot of gold and silver leaf. Oh, yeah. And what it's done, um, it just pops. It's bringing the color back out. Yeah. Yeah. It's just something that I started doing this year more. Because, you know, this work, you know, is done, it takes a long time, but it's done very quickly each step. You know, so I have to figure out things to do here, so I remain in my studio. So I started working with um, gold leaf, and so it's been quite fun because uh, it's bringing a different dimension to my work that I had not seen before, and different lighting coming through. It's kind of fun. It glows, yeah. It glows, yeah. And um, you do a lot of, many of your paintings will have fish, yeah. and um, I have a couple of several other pieces, but there's one that's all fish going one direction except one is doing it. Yeah. So, you know, as always, we're going to invite you to go look at their studios. And the other thing, I talked before about going around and looking at different artists' palettes and that their palettes and the way they arrange it can tell you a lot about the person. But also, just stand back once in a while and watch from afar to see, I mean, you get into your painting, oh, yeah. Yeah. and it, it's, a, it's a moment, and he says goodbye to all of his paintings when they leave. Yes, I do. Yes. <laughs> well, when, when I'm painting, I'm actually, actually painting for me has been a salvation, because I, it's a place where I actually go, and I can actually be in the moment, you know, it's just, I'm there, and, you know, just there. And it's just like a prayer. And, uh, and then when I'm not painting, then 
life comes back to me, all the problems, everything back to do, but I'm actually painting, it's really a very quiet time. Just I like that. Absolutely. And is there a message to the one fish going the opposite direction? Just follow your own heart. <laughs> <laughs> so when you go, when you see a fish painting in Adolfo's, if there's multiple fish, I challenge you to find the one going the opposite direction. <laughs> Well, sometimes you won't see it because I have overworked it so much that it's going to be weird. It's been sanded off. It's gone on its journey. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. But um, it's just, there's and there's so much other, you know, beautiful art here. We have, you know, Sharon Melbourne with her copper weavings and abstraction. She's got the copper woven pieces that if you look closely, you'll start to see a saguaro coming through. Um... So we can't have everything on the panel, but, and then, you know, as far as sculpture, uh, Ryan Schmidt and Gideon, who has typically done a lot of figurative, we now have more of his abstract uh, pieces out there. So it's fun to, you know, after these talks, to kind of go around on a little extra discovery to see if you can identify, you know, some other things and maybe connect with them in a different way than before. Um, do you have some, go ahead. You look like you were going to say something. No? I was going to speak to uh, some of my influences. That, and before we left that topic about the guy that used color, I was painting in the city one night, and toward the end of the night, this guy comes up to me and says, reminded me of the story, he says, uh, you remind me of that artist. And I was like, which one? I was like, that artist. I was like, Picasso? He goes, no, the other one. I said, I said Da Vinci, and he goes, yeah. I go, I go two artists, right? <laughs> but in terms of, uh, you know, this year in particular, I just wanted to share this, uh, this uh, treasure that fell into our life. I've been particularly inspired by the Mount Rushmore artist, Betson Borglum, because uh, this show has the ability to make uh, dreams come true for a lot of artists. And, uh, the family that runs this show is... Uh, has changed uh, a multitude of artists' lives in extraordinary ways. And we, we, uh, it was about a year ago today, my daughter uh, was Zillow surfing and uh, found this property outside New York in Connecticut that was the original stone studio built by the Mount Rushmore sculptor. And uh, we managed to move in there in July. And I, I uh, have been reading a tremendous amount of uh, uh, biographies of the guy. He had an extraordinary career even before all the, the monumental pieces. But, uh, um, you know, so that's one artist that, I, that I'm particularly moved by this year. And I know that Susan's always talking about uh, reaching for the stars and has inspired so many artists. And, when Borglum went down to Stone Mountain to, uh, before he did Rushmore, he did a huge mountain in Georgia, and it was a Civil War monument, and uh, they said to him, Gutson, we want you to do like a 20-foot Robert E. Lee. And he said, well, actually, I'm going to do like 60 figures and 80 horses. And they said, oh, you want the whole mountain? He said, I want the sky, too. <laughs> you know, so it's like that kind of limitless... Uh, uh, reach, but uh, and it, uh, some of my other biggest influences would be someone like uh, Chuck Close, who I think we've talked about, that really epitomizes that fusion of abstract and realism, where you come on close to his work and it just disappears into raw strokes of color and paint. And my uh, figurative work really tries to use that same principle of raw language like that. And one more quick note about the technique that I'm using here. I'm painting on this uh, quarter-inch uh, clear acrylic surface. I'm actually painting on the back and the front side of this uh, clear acrylic panel. So if you have a chance to look at that after the show, you can sort of see it brings that luminosity and depth. And you know, in some ways, you know, is something that I've tried to kind of branch out. Uh, you know, my own language just by the, the material and, and technique approach. So. I, I have always found your figurative paintings very spiritual because uh, I see the, the, the images, you know, the, the people there, but, but they're there, but they're not there. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, it reminds me of, of 
live how everything is changing and moving so quickly that you see a bird there and then you go back and look at it again and it's gone already. Did I see that bird? So your painting is always striking as something very spiritual and like soul-like somehow. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's funny that people... I think you're not the only one. Yeah. yeah. People that have the association to uh, figure painting as like older European painting, I hear all the time like these paintings look like the Last Supper, yeah. and I usually say it's the Last Call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now I remember this uh, article in National Geographic I saw years ago where they went, went around the world and each person, each family took all their possessions and put it in front of their house and from, you know, little tribes, you know, with this much stuff all the way to Americans with like, you know, a tanker full of material. Everyone always had their same kind of icons that they they lived with and you know we are you know truly blessed to be in that profession where we're able to devote our lives to you know investing our meditations into these these vessels that you know uh people uh you know choose to live with yeah that have meaning to others yeah so um i'd love to know if there's any questions can we always sometimes miss the, the, the key points because we're all excited about what we're talking about. Anybody? Questions? No questions, but just a comment. I think this is the most amazing panel I've ever heard in these situations. I think each member, each member has been outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, see? Yeah. Out well. thank, thank you so much. 20% off for that, man. 25 and it's done. This is for Adolfo. Uh, Where? Right here. Where? Right here. Right here. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. Hi, Kathy. Hi. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about your massive blue piece that turned into being the where you had. Well, I mean, we could bring it really quick because it would be difficult to speak can, without it. Can you? Yeah. I'll, I'll do it. Okay. What one second? <laughs> After this commercial break. <laughs> Jake, Jake, well, Adolfo's already there, honey. Yeah, um, great But, okay, yeah, there's always great stories. And that's why we love this so much, because um, as much as you guys love learning about the artists, the artists are so inspired by you. And, you know, there's it's a collective, a collaboration that sometimes we don't even think about, but every painting that's done, whether here or at your studio, has a little piece of everybody in it. Yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. Okay. Yesterday. Uh -oh. There I go, mechanically. <laughs> no. Michael always laughs at me because I am so not mechanical and fine at all. Don't put a tool in my hand. <laughs> um, yesterday was so funny. I, I had uh, a regular collector come. She hadn't been here for a couple of years. Uh, since COVID, and I, and I do these small little studies, they're eight by eight, and she came up to him, she goes, I need this painting, and it was just this little orange painting with like two blobs of white, and she said, I have to have this because there's snowman. I'm like, I'm like, snowman? Oh, there's snowman. So everybody sees something different, but I kind of relate to what she was saying because she came from the Midwest like me. So she's like, I need a little snowman in my house. I call it snowman on orange. Yeah. And you have a cool touch on the series too. But okay, let's uh anyway, so you asked. So what's my about it? But so when I started working on this piece, you know, like what do you got? What do you guys see in there? I mean, do you see anything? I see it. Thank you. Put it up on the chair. Oh, yeah. I see it. Okay. 
So when I first started painting this piece, it was just like we talked about, it's just about you know lines and feelings and you know just playing with texture. And then when I looked at it, I thought, oh my god, there is a baby elephant yeah. Yeah. here. And I think that her mom, and then you know, your mind keeps imagining things, of course. And then you see the mom behind. Her and then there's a little child that when the light hits just right, you can see him. Yeah. Right around. Anyway, so I had it and um I kind of got tired of the elephant story, so I turned it upside down. Somebody said, what about if you turn it upside down, what would happen? He said, well, you're going to see a dead elephant, but not now. Just see what Beautiful. And look at that color. Oops, that's okay. The color is dreamy. And now? It's my first man of white experience here. <laughs> so, so, as you can see, when you know, an Astra could, you know, dispute many different things. So, if you ever, if you have an Astra at home and you want to turn it upside down, you want to actually see another painting from that and see it down. So, um, so what uh, are you satisfied with it? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. The first time I saw that, I didn't see the elephant. Oh, first time I didn't see the elephant, and then the second time I walked by, I said, Oh my gosh, there's an elephant. Yeah. Well, that's the fun of abstract art, it's like yeah. multiple paintings in one. Yeah, yeah, they call it like Adolfo does color deeply. I just like to make the comment that when I remember looking, whether it's at Adolfo's or anybody else's paintings, I look at them side by side and upside down, and that because my God, you ever see lots of different things. It's awesome. And, and then depending on the light of your home, and, yeah. you, know, you can just. Wow. Yeah. I love my adult paintings. And I love the way you name your paintings too. Like you guys all have good names, but. Yeah. Except we never remember. <laughs> you never remember when you. Yeah. Never. I always try to name them. Well, but then people will like say, oh, you know the name of that painting? I like last year. I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> No idea. If you show me the image, then I'll remember. It's just kind of like um, names. Terrible. But I remember faces. So It's hard enough to remember names of clients, let alone our paintings. <laughs> well, I appreciate the names. And sometimes we name our own. Like, uh, Robin is one who notoriously won't name a piggy, so we get to name them when we buy them. So, um, you guys have been great, and thank you for your kind thoughts. And Adolfo, thank you. I'm so so glad you said yes. If I have a chip here next week, you'll know why. <laughs> Adolfo, I agree. And Kathleen, thank you so much. And Stuart, you guys are amazing. Adolfo is in the front row. Kathleen uh, is about halfway, not quite halfway down on the south side, and Stuart's down toward the end. You've got to keep him back in the corner on the north side. So please enjoy, ask questions if you like. And next week is um, um, all about art and family. We have our generational artists, our Matt and Greg Sievers, our Tiffany Gray and Matt Sievers, and the, the magnetic couple is uh, Sunday and Brad Rupert. So come back for that. Thank you so much.